Hello and chapter five of The Dog with the Golden Eyes. Cassie wanted to sing out loud and dance for joy. The dog would be her friend and it was the beginning of a friendship. She hastily ate the cookie in her hand, went into the house and put away her supplies. With the complete dog book propped up on her pillow, she stretched out on her bed. Slowly, she turned the pages. The complete dog book had pictures from every breed of dog recognized by the kennel clubs around the world, including some dogs that Cassie had never heard of. But there wasn't a single breed that was exactly like the white dog. The two that resembled him the most were the Alaskan Malamute and the Siberian Husky. Cassie always lumped those two together as Eskimo dogs, the ones that ran in the Iditarod races. The Alaskan Malamute was the biggest, about the right size, and his face looked almost like the white dogs, but that's where the resemblance stopped. The white dog was streamlined, with legs unusually long and thin. The Malamute was very stocky. The Siberian Husky in the picture was pure white, like her dog, Cassie read on. The Siberian Husky is naturally friendly and gentle in temperament. They are intelligent, faithful, reliable, and known for their speed and endurance. She hoped her dog was a Siberian Husky, but then she read the description. Her dog was much too tall and thin. None of the pictures looked like her white dog. The white dog was terribly thin. He must have been on the road for a long time, hiding out, Scavenging for food, Cassie frowned. What would he look like if he'd been fed for a while? She went through the book a second time. His picture was not there. She decided to tell Mr. Cowell about the stray dog and ask him for his help. The next day, she could hardly wait to go to school and to talk to Mr. Crowell. She knew how much he loved animals and he would surely be able to know what kind of dog he was. She watched for the animal control truck, but didn't see it anywhere. She breathed a sigh of relief. In the science room before class, the boys had gathered around Brad Keeler. Cassie could see his blonde hair above all the others. Brad was bragging about going hunting next weekend. He had his tag for deer, whatever that meant. Th though Cassie thought it couldn't be anything good for the deer. When the bell rang for class to begin and everyone took their places, Cassie sat, saw that Brad was wearing camouflage pants, heavy boots that laced. He swaggered onto his desk and she saw the teacher frowning, but he didn't say anything. During science class, she checked out two more dog books. And when the bell rang at the end of class and the students stampeded out of the room, Cassandra lingered by Mr. Crowell's desk and he looked up. A couple of days ago, a big white dog came into my yard, she began. Her voice never squeaked when she was talking to the teacher. He was really beautiful. I've never seen any dog like him. I wondered what kind he is. Tell me more about him. She said carefully, well, he looks like an Eskimo dog. You know, the dogs in the Alaskan sled races but I think that he's taller, especially thick around his neck, and he's pure white. His fur is so white it shines like silver. Mr. Crowell nodded as, as she spoke and slowly rocked up and down. He has a longish muzzle and pointed ears. She felt her voice take on the feeling of awe and his eyes are slanted. Mr. Crowell smiled. He certainly does sound like some kind of sled dog. Alaskan Malamute or Siberian Husky? You've looked at the American Kennel Club book. She nodded. I can't find any dog exactly like him. He looks almost like a Malamute, but he's too tall and thin. He's too big to be any of the other Eskimo dogs too. Mr. Krell nodded thoughtfully. Could be a cross between a Malamute and another breed. I suppose it's possible, but I don't think so. Cassandra said quickly. He doesn't look like a mongrel. Mr. Carl studied her face. Well, you can't tell if a dog is purebred just by looking at him. But he's so aristocratic, she cleared her throat. 
I've never seen her voice trailed off. Are you sure the AKC book you used was the latest edition? They've just recognized some exotic new breeds. Cassie nodded. I even went through a book that had breeds recognized in other countries. I couldn't find anything that looked exactly like him. Mr. Crowl considered this. Have you looked in the lost and found column of the newspaper? Cassie felt her stomach lurch. No, I hadn't thought of that. Anyway, we don't subscribe to the newspaper. Mom says she wouldn't have any time to read it. She felt sick. It had never occurred to her that whoever owned him would advertise. She had thought only of how scared she thought he was. There might be a reward. Oh, she felt even worse. She wanted the dog, not a reward. But what if his owners had advertised for him and someone wasn't, who wasn't his owner but wanted a reward saw the dog go by? She spoke quickly. All I know is that he's awfully hungry, so I started feeding him. He's come to your house more than once? Cassie hesitated. I was on the back porch having a snack and he smelled the food and came onto the yard. So I fed him. Yesterday I bought a can of dog food and he came back and I gave him half of it. I'll give him the other half this afternoon. Mr. Crowell gazed out the window. But he must be missed. I'll look in the papers when I get home this evening. A dog so beautiful as you say, he must belong to someone. But then why is he so scared? Protested Cassie. I think he's run away. You should see how scared he is. I can't get anywhere near him yet. It will be a long time before I can even pet him. Someone has treated him not right. She found herself trembling. I'll treat him right. She took a deep breath and rushed on. I want to feed him every day because I want him to adopt me. Mr. Crowell looked at her again. Yes, well, until you find the owner, you certainly ought to feed him. In the meantime, I'll check the lost and found column. Oh, thanks. She hoped there wasn't it be anywhere in an ad for him. She didn't want the owners to get him back. If they had been good to him, then he wouldn't be so scared. They didn't deserve such a beautiful animal. How could people be so mean to animals? She suddenly thought of Brad Keeler and his camouflage suit. She drew a deep breath and said, Mr. Crowell, why don't you do something about Brad Keeler and his always bragging about hunting? He likes killing animals. Mr. Crowell pursed his lips for a minute. He's doing what's legal as far as hunting is concerned, so no one can stop him. And it's not against the law to brag. But why does he go hunting? Mr. Crowell frowned. He told me it's a family sport. A family sport, exclaimed Cassie. That's what he says. His whole family, he and his parents and his brother all go hunting on the weekends. They camp in the forest, cook their own meals, and they have a great time together. For the first time, Cassie felt a pang. Her family had never done anything together like that. She remembered the trip to the circus she had taken with her father while her mother had stayed home. If only Brad could find something to do with his family besides hunting. At least she could find Brad. She could understand Brad having fun going in the woods with his family, she sighed. Another thought crossed her mind. How can it be a real sport if the animals don't have guns and can't shoot back? A brief smile flickered on Mr. Crowell's face. Perhaps he'd like to tell you his side of hunting. I don't want to hear it. I think he's just trying to be macho, like a lot of guys. We'll see. Cassandra bypassed Daisy's ice cream parlor and started home very slowly, thinking in despair about the lost and found column and the animal control truck. When she was depressed, chocolate usually cheered her up. She wondered, how, she wondered how much chocolate she would have to eat before her stomach stopped hurting. As soon as she got home, she went through her hiding places until she found a box of Hershey almond bars. She took three of them and settled herself into her homework, munching as she worked. Slowly, the pain in her stomach began to ease. As soon as her watch told her that it was time for the dog's supper, she fixed the last half of the canned dog food and carried the dish out to the liquid amber tree. She sat quietly at the bottom step and waited. She didn't have to wait long. 
The white dog appeared out of nowhere, approached the dish cautiously, sniffed its contents again, pushed it with the side of his paw until the food spilled all over the ground. You silly dog, said Cassie, watching him push the canned food around in the dirt before eating it. Maybe you don't like eating out of a dish. She wondered if she just dumped the food on the ground next time. Then she realized she would have to buy another can of dog food from the market. Then the dog finished his meal. He licked his chops with his long tongue and crouched on his forepaws facing Cassie. He struck his, he stuck his rump up in the air and swung his tail back and forth. It was almost as though as he was taking a bow. Suddenly he grinned and he had a lopsided grin at once. You're thanking me, she exclaimed. You're very welcome. I'll feed you tomorrow, same time, same place. He bounced up and down several times, making a funny little whining and squeaking noise, then turned and melted into the bushes as silently as he had appeared. Whew, Cassie said happily. She went inside to read the dog books she had brought home. One of the books listed advantages and disadvantages of each type of breed, and even told how much food they needed. She was shocked when she read how much a big dog would eat. For a Malamute or a Husky, a half a can of food was nothing, nothing. Her white dog would have at least two cans of dog food every day and a couple pounds of dry kibble. How could she possibly feed him that much? Cassie received a variable allowance from her mother. It was supposed to be a fixed amount but how much she actually got depended on the tips her mother collected. Her mother kept part of the tip money to use for running the household, but if Cassie needed something extra, her mother was usually good for a soft touch. Cassie had liked, liked it that way because she figured she collected more. She packed her own lunch every day and always brought some extra for the snack line. But now the hard facts were staring her in the face. Even if Cassie didn't buy any more snacks, which was unthinkable, and gave up buying pencils and paper and school stuff, which she would have to do, there wasn't enough money. Even if she didn't buy anything extra at all and saved every penny of her allowance, she still wouldn't have enough money to buy food for her white dog. Cassie took another deep breath and shuddered. She realized she needed more money than she'd ever had before and she didn't dare ask her mother. She would have to find a job.